Cambridge Practice Tests for IELTS. Brought to you by Knowledge Island by Bilal. For computer delivered IELTS practice tests, please visit the link provided in the description. Cambridge Practice Tests for IELTS 1 by Vanessa Jakeman and Claire McDowell. Published by Cambridge University Press, 1996. This recording is copyright. Cassette 1, Slide 1. Practice Test 1. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 of your question booklet. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman and a police officer. First, look at questions 1 to 5. For each of the questions, four alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives, A, B, C or D, best fits what you hear on the tape and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Good evening, City Police Station. Can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to report a stolen briefcase, please. Just a minute and I'll put you through. The woman says she wants to report a stolen briefcase, so A has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions 1 to 5. City Police Station, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to report a stolen briefcase, please. Just a minute and I'll put you through. Lost property, can I help you? Oh, yes. I've had my briefcase stolen. Okay, I'll take some details. Tell me what it looks like, first of all. Well, it's a soft leather one, you know, not a heavy box type like a man's. And how does it close? It's got buckles at the front, two of them. They're gold-plated ones. Fine. Uh, was it locked? No, I'm afraid not. Never mind. Any distinguishing features? Pardon? Any marks or badges on it that make it stand out? Uh, only the brand name. And where's that? It's on the back, at the bottom, in the left-hand corner. It's saggy. Oh, and there's a scratch. It's quite bad, but small, directly above the brand name. I did it recently, putting it on my bike. I've got that. So, what did you have inside the briefcase? Well, all my papers from college. It's so frustrating, but thank goodness for computers. I haven't lost them completely. Yes, you're lucky. I had my wallet in my pocket, so I didn't lose that. But there were also my pens, which I got for my birthday, and a novel I was planning to read on the train. Right. Where exactly did you lose the briefcase? Well, I couldn't believe it. I was standing on the platform. It was right next to me. You were holding it? I just put it down on the floor, but I could almost feel it beside me. I was watching for my train because sometimes it comes early, and then next time I looked... My briefcase wasn't there. And what time was this? Uh, it was... 
It must have been about 5.20. No, a bit later. I'd say 5.30, because it was just getting crowded, and the train normally comes at about 25 to 6. Before they continue their conversation, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, complete the form by filling in the numbered spaces 6 to 10. Right. If you'll just give me some personal details. Yes. What name is it? I'm Mary Prescott. Can you spell that? Yes, it's P-R-E-S-C-O-T-T. -T. And your address? Flat 2, 41 Fountain Road, Canterbury. Fountain Road? Yes, number 41. And have you got a contact telephone number? Yes, it's 752239. 752239. Fine. Uh, one last question. What would you say the value of your briefcase is? Including the contents? Yes. Just a rough estimate is fine. Oh, I'm not sure. Well, the briefcase itself is quite new. I bought it last month for £40. I suppose about £65. The contents are worth about £20 or £25 at least. That's fine. Well, um, if you could come down to the station tomorrow, you can sign this form and have a look at what we've got here. OK, thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a news report from an Australian radio program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen to the news headlines and tick the three other items which are mentioned. This is the 6 o'clock news for Tuesday the 25th of November. And first the headlines. The Prime Minister has promised to help the drought-stricken farmers in the northern part of the country who haven't seen rain for nearly two years. And in Sydney, a group of school children are successfully rescued from a plane which landed in the sea shortly after takeoff. Transport workers are on strike in Melbourne over a pay claim and the strike looks set to spread to other states. And on a fashionable note, there's to be a new look for the staff of Qantas, Australia's national airline. Now you have some time to look at questions 14 to 21.
As you listen to the rest of the news, complete the notes in the spaces provided. The Prime Minister has pledged today that he will make $250 million available to help the drought-stricken farmers who have not seen rain for years get through the next five years. Money that was to have been spent on the restructuring of Sydney's road system has been reallocated to what the Prime Minister described as a more worthy cause. Farmers are to receive financial assistance to help see them through the worst drought in over 50 years. Many farmers feel that while the money is welcome, it has come too late to save them and their farms from financial ruin, and are angry that the government did not act sooner. A group of school children who were travelling in a privately chartered aeroplane from Sydney to Queensland to take part in a musical concert found themselves swimming for the shore when their aeroplane had to land in the sea just three minutes after taking off from Sydney Airport. The pilot managed to bring the aircraft and its 50 passengers down safely in the calm waters of Botany Bay, where boats and pleasure craft were able to come to the rescue of the boys. The fact that it was a weekend meant that there were hundreds of boats in the bay enjoying the good weather, and this undoubtedly helped the rescue operation. We owe our lives to the skill of the pilot, said one of the boys, but the pilot replied modestly that it was all part of a day's work. However, all their musical instruments were lost, and they never got to play at the concert. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear a conversation between a university student and a university lecturer. Look at questions 22 to 25. For each of the questions, four alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives best fits what you hear on the tape and circle the appropriate letter. Hello. Can I come in? Oh, yes. Come in. How can I help you? I was looking for the economics office. I've been all over the arts faculty building looking for it, but I could only find the School of Accounting and Economic History. Is this the right place? Yes. This is the School of Economics. Oh, good. Um, I'm a new student, and I was wondering if someone could give me some information. Well, I might be able to help. I lecture on that program. What do you need to know? Oh, quite a few things, actually. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how many lectures a week do I have to attend? Ah, oh, well, the Economics 1 course is a double unit. So there are two lectures a week and one tutorial. Oh. The lectures are scheduled for Tuesday and Thursday. What time? Ah, oh, let me see. Um, you know, this information is all in the handout, which you should have received yesterday at the orientation meeting. Uh, oh, was there, was there a meeting yesterday? I didn't know about that. Um, no one... Yes, <laughs> there was. But uh, never mind. Now, lectures are at four in the afternoon. Oh, uh, four's a bit late. I've got a part-time job that starts at 4.30. Well, you can't be in two places at once, can you? And attendance at lectures is necessary. We expect at least 90% attendance at this university, you know. 90%? That's high. Do they enforce that rule? Yes, we do. We're pretty strict about it, actually. And what times have been set down for the tutorials? Do you have that information? That's a very well-attended course. So there's a number of tutorial times. Um, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, all at nine o'clock. Yours will be allocated at the first lecture. Can't I choose the time? Maybe, maybe not. You'll have to talk to the lecturer on the course. Dr. Roberts is his name. Oh, okay.
Now look at questions 26 to 31. As the conversation continues, complete the notes in the spaces provided. Anything else I can help you with while you're here? Well, yes, actually. Do you know what the course requirements are? I mean, uh, how much work is expected for this course? Well, you have to complete a tutorial paper. Well, what does that involve? Well, it's a piece of work on a given topic based on some set reading texts. You'll have to give a small talk to your tutorial group. Oh, how long does that have to be? Oh, about 25 minutes, usually. I have to talk for 25 minutes? Yes, that's right. <laughs> and then you have to write up your piece of work and give it to the lecturer to be marked. Right. Uh, and is that all? No. You also have to complete a 3,000-word essay on a topic. Can I choose the topic? Yes, usually you can. Right. Huh. That shouldn't be too bad. And in addition to that, there is an exam. An exam? <laughs> What sort of exam? Well, it's an open book exam. Does that mean I can have the textbook with me during the exam? Yes, that's right. And can you give me any idea about the content of the first year of economics so that I can get into some reading? Well, you'll be getting the reading list next week when lectures start. All the books are in the library. Yes, but won't everyone else take them out as soon as they get the reading list too? Well, yes, they might. But most of the important ones are held in Coe's Reserve. That's a part of the library where you can go to read books, but you can't take them out of the building. What did you call that section of the library? Closed reserve. However, we do recommend that you buy the core books. You'll find them useful, and you'll need them for the exam. Yes, I suppose I will. But what is the focus of the course? Well, the course at this university has a vocational focus. That is, a focus on preparing its graduates for work. So we're orientated very much towards employment. Oh, so my chances of getting a job are good. Well, provided you get good results. Well, look, thanks for your time. You've been really helpful. <laughs> That's fine. See you next week, then. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a university lecturer about the structure of the university. First, look at questions 32 to 36. Now listen and answer questions 32 to 36. Good morning and welcome to the University of Westlands. Uh, my name is Marcia Mayhew and I'm the coordinator of the Bachelor of Social Science degree. Uh, this morning I'd like to tell you about the structure of the university and so about some of the requirements of the degree that you're about to enter. The Bachelor of Social Science is in one faculty within the university. That is the faculty where I work, known as Arts and Social Sciences. Here on this campus we also have the faculties of Architecture, 
law and science and technology, among others. Uh, it's important to know something about the structure of the faculty because as you go through your course, you may need to call on members of the staff to help you. At the top of the faculty, we have a dean, and below the dean, we have three divisions. Each division has a divisional head, and your degree is located in the Division of Social Sciences. Within each of the divisions, there are the departments, and each of these offers the different degrees. For instance, two of the departments which offer the major subjects for your award are Sociology and Psychology. Each has a departmental head, but for practical purposes, the people you are going to see the most of are myself as coordinator of the social sciences degree and the actual lecturers who are teaching the subjects that you are taking. For instance, in the first semester, you'll be doing four subjects, psychology, sociology, history and economics. If you have any problems or difficulties... Not that I'm anticipating you will, but you never know. <laughs> then you should go and see your lecturers. For instance, you may find that you can't meet a deadline for an essay, or perhaps you're having problems with attendance. Uh, these seem to be the two most common problems that students face. Now look at questions 37 to 41. As you listen to the rest of the talk, answer the questions 37 to 41. If your lecturers are unavailable, you can always come and see me in my office. I'm available on Wednesday and Thursday mornings and on Friday afternoons. Outside these hours, perhaps you could ring the secretary and make an appointment. Now... You'll note that all of the subjects which you undertake in the first year are composed of lectures and tutorials. A lecture is about an hour long and a tutorial usually runs for about two hours. A lecture is rather like what I'm doing now, where one person will talk to all of you together on a subject. Now, we do ask you to try to attend the lectures. <laughs> a tutorial is perhaps where most of the learning occurs at a university. You will be divided into groups of between 12 and 15 students, and each week one of you will have to present a piece of work to the group as a whole, and then the group will discuss what you've said. It's this discussion, this exchange of ideas, which really constitutes the basis of university learning, in my view. Listening to lectures in many ways is just giving you information that you could access for yourself in the library. But the discussion at the tutorial is very important. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to the lectures, though. <laughs> Other factors to be particularly concerned about are the structure of essays and delivery of written material. And in particular, I would like to mention the question of plagiarism. Plagiarism is taking other people's work without acknowledging it. That is, without saying where it comes from. Now, of course, all essays are based on research done by other people, but you must remember to attribute the work to the original writer. And while it's a good idea to work with other people, don't hand in work which is exactly the same as your friend's work because we will notice. <laughs> if you don't acknowledge the source of your information, then you run the risk of failing the subject or in very serious cases, you might be denied entry to the university. 
Last but not least, stay in touch with us. If things are getting you down, don't go and hide. Come and talk to us about it. That's what we're here for. Right. Um, thank you very much for coming along today. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Practice test two. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section one. In this section. You will hear two overseas students, Kate and Luki, being interviewed by a university counsellor. First, look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Hi there, Kate. Come on in. How are you today? Fine, thanks. Hi, Lukey. How's things? Okay. Well, as I explained on the phone, I'm a counsellor here at the student services section of the university. And I'm interviewing overseas students to help me draw up a guide for new students. So I'd be grateful if you could tell me a little about your time since you've been here in Cambridge. Right. Yeah. Now, Kate, let's start with you. Okay.、Um, this is your second semester, isn't it? Could you tell us something about your first impressions of the town when you arrived?、Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, I was struck by how quiet it is here in the evening. Kate's first impression of the town is that it is quiet in the evening, so quiet is the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen to the first interview with Kate and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces one to five. Hi there, Kate. Come on in. How are you today? Fine, thanks. Hi, Luki. How's things? Okay. Well, as I explained on the phone, I'm a counsellor here at the student services section of the university, and I'm interviewing overseas students to help me draw up a guide for new students. So I'd be grateful if you could tell me a little about your time since you've been here in Cambridge. Right. Yeah. Now, Kate, let's start with you. Okay. Um, this is your second semester, isn't it? Could you tell us something about your first impressions of the town when you arrived?、Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, I was struck by how quiet it is here in the evening. Yeah, I suppose Cambridge is a quiet place. Um, where did you live when you first arrived? Well, I, I went straight into student accommodation. It was a kind of student hostel. 
Ah, right. So uh, you didn't have to worry about doing your own cooking or anything like that? No, but sometimes I wished I had. The food at the hostel was awful. Oh, dear. (laughs) But how were the other students? Uh, To be honest, I haven't managed to make many friends, even though the place is full. People seem to keep to themselves. They're not really very friendly. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, well, what about the actual course? You're studying, um... Um, I'm doing a master's by coursework in environmental studies. Oh, right. And how are you finding that? Yeah, well, it's been pretty good, really. I've enjoyed the course. But I feel there hasn't been enough contact with the lecturers. They, They all seem to be incredibly busy. The only chance I've really had to talk to them was on the field trip. Well, that's no good. Uh -uh. Um, could anything be done to improve the course, in your opinion? Well, I think it would be helpful to have meetings with lecturers on the course. Say, once a fortnight, something like that. Regular meetings? Uh Uh-huh. Yes, that could certainly help. Now, Kate, we'll come back to you in a minute, but I'd just like to ask Lucy some questions. Before they continue the interview, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the interview, complete the notes. Lukey, where are you from? I am from Indonesia. And how did you find Cambridge when you first arrived? Well, I like it here. I think the city is very beautiful. What about your accommodation? Was that okay? Yes, okay. At first, I stayed with a family for three months. They were very kind to me but they had three young children, and I found it difficult to study. Right, I see. So after three months, I moved out, and now I live with two other students in a student house. It's much cheaper, and we like it there. Good. And um, what about your studies? What are you studying? I'm doing a Bachelor of Computing. Computing, I see. Um, Apart from the language difficulties, if you can separate them... How have you found the course? Okay, but... Yes, go on. Well, the main difficulty for me is getting time on the computers in the computer room. Ah. It's always busy, and, and this makes it very hard to do my practical work. Yes, I'm sure it would. Can you reserve time in the computer room? No, you can't. But it would certainly help if we could reserve computer time. Yes. I'll look into that and see if something can't be done to improve things over there. Now, let's go back to Kate. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a radio tour about buying a bicycle. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the first part of the talk and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 
11 to 20. Well, last week we talked about buying camping equipment, and today I'd like to talk to you about buying a bicycle. A simple enough exercise, you might imagine, but there are lots of things to look out for to make sure you get the best deal for your money. Well, the range of bicycles is enormous. There are racing bikes, touring bikes, mountain bikes, or just plain ordinary bikes for riding around town. They vary enormously in two basic ways, price and quality. This means that the choice you make will probably be determined by the amount of money you want to pay, your own personal needs, what is actually available, or a compromise of all three things. However, in broad terms, you can spend anything from $50 to $2,000 on a bike, so you'll need to know what you're looking for. Single speed cycles, that is bikes with no gears, are really only suited to short, casual rides. Their attraction is their simplicity and reliability. After years of neglect, they still manage to function, though not always too efficiently. If it's basic transport you're after, then you can't go wrong. Three speed cycles, on the other hand, are all that is really necessary for most town riding, going to the shops and things like that. Like the single speed bike, they're simple and reliable. If you're going to be going up and down lots of hills, then you'll probably want something more efficient. Five and ten speed bicycles are best suited to riding over long distances or hilly terrain and to serious touring. So if it's serious touring you're interested in, get a five or ten speed bike. However, it's worth remembering that the difference in price between a 5 and 10 speed cycle is usually very little, and so it's well worth paying that little bit extra to get the 10 speed one. So I would tend to recommend the 10 speed bike as the price is similar. However, you'll be getting better quality components. Now the next thing we need to look at is size. Buying a cycle is like buying clothes. First of all, you find the right size, and then you try it on to see if it fits. Contrary to what you might imagine, the size of the cycle is not determined by the size of the wheels, except in children's cycles, but by the size of the frame. So you'll need to measure the length of your legs and arms to get a frame that is the right size for you. Well, that's all from Helpful Hints for today. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear a conversation between two students, Fiona and Martin, talking about a tutorial topic. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi there, Martin. How are you going with your Australian Studies tutorial paper? Oh, good. I finished it, actually. Lucky you. What did you do it on? I'm still trying to find an interesting topic. Well, after some consideration, I decided to look at the history of banana growing in Australia. Banana growing? Yeah, banana growing. Fascinating, I'm sure. Well... It's not as boring as you'd think, and I wanted to tie it into the work I've been doing on primary industries and the economy. Anyway, I bet there are a few things you didn't know about bananas. Such as? Such as the fact that bananas were among the first plants ever to be domesticated. Oh, really? Yeah, they're an extremely nourishing food. I suppose you're going to tell me the whole history of banana growing now, aren't you? <laughs> well, it'll be a good practice run for my tutorial next week. 
I'll do the same for you sometime. Okay, fire away. So where were these bananas first domesticated? According to my research, the Cavendish banana, which is a, a type of banana and the first type to be cultivated here, actually originated in China, but they had a fairly roundabout route before they got to Australia. You mean they didn't go straight from China to Australia? No, they didn't. It seems that in 1826, bananas were taken from South China to England. I suppose they'd have made a welcome addition to the English diet. Yes, I'm sure. Well, apparently there was an English duke who was particularly fond of bananas, and he used to cultivate them in his hothouse, which is where you have to grow them in England, of course, because of the cool climate. And they became quite popular in the UK. So he was the one responsible for cultivating the Cavendish banana, which was then introduced into Australia. I see. And we've been growing them ever since. Yeah. Now look at questions 25 to 32. As the conversation continues, complete Martin's notes. Are they hard to grow? Well, yes and no. To grow them in your garden, no, not really. But to grow them commercially, you need to know what you're doing. You see, you only get one bunch of bananas per tree, and it can take up to three years for a tree to bear fruit if you don't do anything special to it. But this period is greatly reduced with modern growing methods particularly in plantations where you have perfect tropical conditions. Right. So what are you looking at? One year? Two years? No, no, around 15 months in good conditions for a tree to produce a, a bunch of bananas. And once you've got your bunch, you cut the bunch and the plant down. So how do the trees reproduce then? Well, bananas are normally grown from suckers, which spring up around the parent plant, usually just above the plant. They tend to like to grow uphill, or at least that's the common wisdom. So that's why banana plantations are usually on hillsides, is it? Yeah, they grow best like that. That's interesting. If you plant them in rich soil and give them plenty of water at the beginning of summer, then they should be well advanced by the beginning of winter when growth virtually stops. But in a country like England, they're hard to grow. Although, you can grow them in a hothouse. But in Australia, it's not difficult. No. Though even here, the growers put plastic bags around the bunches to protect them and keep them warm. If you go up to the banana growing districts, you'll see all these banana trees with plastic bags on them. But how do they stop the bananas going bad before they reach the shops? Well, the banana bunches are picked well before the fruit's ripe. Once you cut the bunch, the bananas stop growing, but they, they do continue to ripen. The interesting thing is that once one banana ripens, it gives off a gas which then helps all the others to ripen. So they pretty much all ripen within a few hours of each other. Amazing. So do we export lots of bananas overseas to Europe and Asia, for instance? Well, oddly enough, no. I believe New Zealand takes a small proportion of the crop, but otherwise well, they're mostly grown for the domestic market, which is surprising when you think about it, because we grow an enormous number of bananas each year. Yes, well, thank you for all that information. I'm sure the tutorial paper will go really well. You certainly seem to have done your research on the subject. Let's hope so. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear part of a public lecture for new students. First, look at questions 33 to 35.
Now listen and answer questions 33 to 35. Uh, good morning, good morning everyone, and uh, welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. Um, this series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union, and is part of the Union's attempt to help you, the students of this university, to stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. So, um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to welcome back Ms. Diane Greenbaum, who is a professional dietitian and um, who has been kind enough to give up her time in what I know is a very hectic schedule to come along and talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. May I say it's a pleasure to be back. Now, stresses at university, being away from home and uh, having to look after yourselves, uh, learning your way around the campus, all contribute to making it quite hard sometimes to ensure that your diet is adequate. So, today, I'm going to talk about ways of making sure that you eat well, while at the same time staying within your budget. Now look at questions 36 to 41. As you listen to the second part of the lecture, complete the notes and diagram in the spaces provided. If you have a well-balanced diet, then you should be getting all the vitamins that you need for normal daily living. However, sometimes we think we're eating the right foods, but um, the vitamins are escaping, perhaps as a result of cooking, and uh, anyway, we're not getting the full benefit of them. Now, if you lack vitamins in any way, the solution isn't to rush off and take vitamin pills, though uh, they, they can sometimes help. No, it's far better to look at your diet and how you prepare your food. So, what are vitamins? Well, the dictionary tells us they are food factors essential in small quantities to maintain life. Now, there are fat-soluble vitamins, which can be stored for quite some time by the body, and there are water-soluble vitamins, which are removed more rapidly from the body. And so, a regular daily intake of these ones is needed. Okay, so um, how can you ensure that your diet contains enough of the vitamins you need? Well, first of all, you may have to establish some new eating habits. No more chips at the uni canteen, I'm afraid. <laughs> now, firstly, you must eat a variety of foods. Then you need to ensure that you eat at least four servings of fruit and vegetables daily. Now, you'll need to shop two or three times a week to make sure that they're fresh and store your vegetables in the fridge or in a cool, dark place. Now, let's just refresh our memories by looking at the healthy diet pyramid. Okay, can you all see that? Good. Well, now, as you see, we've got three levels to our pyramid. At the top, in the smallest area, are the things which we should really be trying to avoid as much as possible. Things like, um, yes, sugar, salt, butter, all that sort of thing. Uh, next, on the middle of uh, our pyramid, we find the things that we can eat in moderation. Uh, not too much, though, and um, that's where we find uh, milk, lean meat, fish, nuts, eggs. And then at the bottom of the pyramid are the things that you can eat lots of, because uh, they're the things that are really good for you. Uh, here we have bread, vegetables, and fruit. So, don't lose sight of your healthy diet pyramid when you do your shopping. Mm -hmm. 
That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. If you are new to our channel, please subscribe us and press the bell icon to get more updates. Don't forget to comment, like, and share our video.